Today is November 4th, 2016, and we are interviewing Shannon Reynolds in Taylorville. Shannon is 42 years old, having been born on November 28th, 1973. My name is Sue Burkholder, and I will be the interviewer. Um, Shannon, would you please state for the recording in what branch of service that you served? Uh, United States Army. Okay, and what time period was this? From 1996 to 2001. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to start with a little bit of background, way background data. Uh, where were you born, and could you tell us just a little bit about your family? I was born in Scott Air Force Base. Uh, my father is a 24-year veteran of the United States Air Force. Uh, my grandfather was a 22-year veteran of the United States Air Force. Um, I have two aunts and three uncles that served. Mm -hmm. uh, I've generally lived in a military family. I grew up on Air Force bases. Okay. All right. Did you have any siblings? Uh, my sister is currently serving with the United States Air Force. Okay. At Ellsworth Air Force Base. Okay. She's with Air Force Intelligence. All right. So when you were, um, what was it like growing up in a military family? Well, obviously you move around a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but it was kind of, uh, it's different than growing up, I guess, in public, where you have social differences and uh, economic differences. Well, all of our dads, we all lived together, all of our dads worked together, all of our parents made the same money, shopped at the same stores. Mm -hmm. So it was, I didn't run into the non-integration that was not in, out in the, uh, non-military families okay. as it wasn't until my dad retired that I even saw the difference in the color of people mm -hmm. okay. and what were you doing then um, before you entered the military service yourself were you working or well I, I was going to college and uh, my father got a car accident with my mother and I had to take care of them for a while um, once my father got up on his feet, um, which was 1995, I, uh, I enlisted. Um, my plan was to, to uh, enlist in ROTC, but due to the accident, I had to leave college, mm -hmm. so I enlisted. Okay. All right. And obviously, you, s you chose your your branch because of the family ties? Well, I chose the Army um, because they would guarantee me that I would work on the uh, Black Hawk and I would get a flight status spot. Okay. Because um, I wanted to work rotor wing, I wanted to work on helicopters. Mm -hmm. It was a lot harder to get a helicopter spot in the Air Force, believe it or not, than it was in the Army. Hmm. So. Okay. <coughs> So you've signed up and you are off to basic training. What was the first few days of basic training like for you? Well, it, it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. I mean, there was, there was a lot of yelling, a lot of running around, but I generally knew what was going to happen. I mean, so much of my family told me what's going to happen in basic training. Um, I knew that they were going to try to confuse me and try to send us all over the place. So it wasn't that big of an integration. Um, I guess the weirdest part was uh, always around other people. It was, and you got to know people so quickly and so much about them um, so quickly that you didn't really have a choice. Um, I don't know, for me there was Everybody was, was friendly with everybody else. It wasn't, we didn't have any pariahs or, or anything like that. So we got close pretty quick. And it was, I went to, when I went to basic at Fort Jackson, and there were females in our platoon, and that was rather interesting because half our platoon would leave at night. And uh, so they would be gone and it would be us. We would talk about them and then they would talk about us. So it was, uh, <laughs> that was the interesting part. Okay. Are there any memorable things that happened that really stick out in your mind during basic? Um, I have a memorable drill sergeant, drill sergeant Gaines. 
He was about 6'5", and he was huge, and he never raised his voice. And you would hear all the other drill sergeants yelling, and somehow this huge black man, you would be doing something, and he would suddenly appear behind you asking high speed, exactly what are you doing? <laughs> and at that moment, you would be doing something wrong, and you knew you were doing something wrong. It was just, it was very memorable that a man that big could suddenly appear and just move so quietly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. All right, so um, you've moved through basic training. Um, I, I don't know, how was the food, how were the accommodations, that type of thing? Well, we lived in older barracks. Um, the food was good. It, this was also the first time when we uh, were allowed to leave post for about, it had been about three months, three and a half months. Um, so, and it was interestingly enough, even after that short period of time, a little bit of culture shock because it was going from something that was super regimented to complete chaos. Mm -hmm. um, walking in a mall, uh, you could definitely spot um, trainees, military trainees, compared to civilians just by the way they walked, the way they, uh, they stayed close to each other, the way they walked in step. Um, so that was, that was the interesting, you know, when it came to accommodations. And guys cut loose. Uh, That was also kind of interesting to see what a guy would talk about after he had a few drinks. Mm -hmm. um, but even within all that, I can't remember, you know, any fights. I remember, you know, guys calling each other to come pick me up. We had to get a cab. We had to take cabs everywhere. But it was always you would go somewhere and you would spot somebody you knew from post. It's like everywhere we went, there was somebody from post, so you always had somebody to talk to, somebody to uh, um, be around. You were never alone. So that was another part of the integration is, is you were always had somebody there. Okay. So you finished basic training and did you go on to, it, what advanced training did you yeah, that's AIT. Um, that's what I was talking about when the first time we got off post. I did AIT at Fort Eustis, Virginia, mm -hmm. which is right outside Norfolk uh, Naval Base. Um, <laughs> and that was April, April into May, June, and it started getting hot. <laughs> we were right there on the coast. Uh, hadn't seen the ocean in 15 years at that point, so it was that was an interesting, you know, to get back to the ocean to swim in the ocean, um, and to get our hands on aircraft. Mm -hmm. I was a, uh, I was training on the Black Hawk UH-60 Blackhawks, um, and to get the uh, the scope and size of the aircraft to get our hands dirty. Mm -hmm. um, spend five days a week um, learning the aircraft. Um, so it was about three and a half months of training just working on the aircraft. Okay. And um, so you're going through AIT. Was there anything memorable during AIT? Well, at AIT was the first time that I met my son. He was born while I was in basic training. So that was definitely memorable to, uh, to have my wife and my mother-in-law come out and visit me. Um, and I was able to spend the weekend with them. Um, I, we went to Bush Gardens. We'd spent some time. And it was... 
you know, basic training that can't really accommodate your family because just everything has to be cut off. But at AIT, they did the, my drill sergeant did the best he could to accommodate me and being with my family. He even wrote me a special pass so I could leave. Um, so that's probably the biggest experience at, at AIT because most of it is just learning and learning and learning. You have so much information thrown at you in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Obviously a Black Hawk is a complicated piece of machinery. Um, you mentioned the reason you went into the Army is because you wanted to work oh. on the Black Hawks and that um, when you were in AIT did that like um, uh, increase your uh, um, how to say it, your love or your your just desire to work with those those type of Yes, and it, initially I was overwhelmed by just the sheer, you know, complication of the aircraft. Because mm -hmm. um, I wanted to fly, and I knew that this was the quickest path to fly. Um, but it was, you know, moving all over the aircraft, um, sitting in a pilot seat, sitting in a crew member's seat, um, climbing the tail boom. There were a lot of just little things about the aircraft that, you know, sparked my interest. And I'd, I hadn't really thought about how much of a mechanic I would be as I would be, you know, flying. Mm -hmm. um, but I really did enjoy working on the aircraft is, you know, I knew at some point when they, the instructors told us, you're going to be assigned an aircraft, this aircraft's going to have your name on it, and you're going to be responsible for it. So that was one of the things we were really looking forward to, is AIT was a lot of time looking forward to things that were going to happen, mm -hmm. hearing stories from uh, our instructors. So um, now you've made it through AIT and you've got that experience, then uh, what was your next um, I was, duty? I was deployed to uh, the Republic of South Korea okay. um, with Charlie Company. Uh, it's an AVM unit, it's an intermediate aviation unit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a flight unit, but it was a, uh, uh, a higher level of, of mechanics. Um, so initially I was disappointed that I wasn't flying. Um, and also, initially I wasn't working on Blackhawks. I was working on OH-58 Kiowas. Um, what had happened is the Kiowas and the Hueys were being phased out. So they, they weren't training enough people to work on the aircraft that they had. So we had people cross training. Mm -hmm. And I would work on either Hueys or OH-58s, sometimes Blackhawks. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time working on OH-58s. And that's how I got into aircraft recovery. Okay. And um, tell me about that. Well, it was in the middle of 97. Um, the colonel was flying an OH-58 and he had engine failure. Um, I want to point out, point something out is, is it, the OH-58 only has one engine. If you have engine failure, you don't have anything to fall back on. Um, but the pilots, both of them were able to maneuver an aircraft without power away from uh, population areas to miss a road and to land in a creek to ensure that it didn't hurt anybody. It destroyed the aircraft and both pilots walked away. But it was also my first introduction into um, what could happen. Um, we have a saying, you get a flat tire, you pull over. Um, your engine fails in an aircraft, there's no place to pull over. So. But that was, and I had to learn about investigations, and uh, it just sort of moved me into that direction. You know, you sort of fall into one of those things, 
And once you get that experience, you get tapped again. But there, it also let me know that just because there's no bullets flying doesn't mean your life's not on the line. And later, um, after I left Korea, I found that out. But I spent, Korea was, was more than just, um, cause again, you had to become so close with the other guys in your units because most of the people there you couldn't even talk to. Um, I wanted to bring up, we had what's called Katusas, Korean Augmentees to the United States Army. Um, they served right next to us. Uh, while they were in the Korean Army, you know, they were actually integrated into our units. Um, none of them actually worked on Blackhawks, or none of them were actually aircraft mechanics. Um, they would work Humvees, and they were clerks, and, and other jobs. Uh, and they were all drafted. And, and they would make anywhere from like 12 to $15 a month drafted into the Korean army. So whenever they went out with us, generally they were our interpreters um, and they knew the spots, but they never paid because they never, I mean, if their family sent them money. But generally these guys were just, they were all drafted doing their two years and <laughs> didn't have a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And how did that, um, did that change your perspective about? Well, it, it definitely changed my perspective, you know, when people talk about how, how bad things are in the United States um, and how bad their job is or, you know, how little money they make. And uh, they could, all of their clothes were given to them. Um, they were given haircuts. Uh, generally just maintained until they were out of the military. Um, but it was just soldiers, no soldiers. And, and I don't know any other way to put it than that is, um, especially if you're working next to us, it doesn't really matter, you know, were you born American or not? Well, no, you're a soldier right now. And you're, as far as I'm concerned, you're a soldier in the United States Army, whether you're, you're in the Korean Army or the United States Army. Um, but it, everybody I served with volunteered. Um, none of these men volunteered. They were, they were all drafted. And they were all lucky enough to score high enough because being a Katusa was like an elite thing for the Korean Army. Otherwise, you were going to be, you know, a, a rock army grunt. And the difference between um, the U.S. military and the rock army, the Republic of Korea, um, we call them rocks. Mm -hmm. um, the sergeants there could still lay hands on you. Um, and you travel around um, and see them. In the United States, you, you don't see the military very often. They're in the background. Um, in Korea, they're right up front. You come to an intersection and there'll be a squad of soldiers armed with submachine guns. Um, I remember flying. Um, we were testing an aircraft after we'd repaired it. And we flew one direction and I looked down and I, I saw some, some missiles. Um, and when we flew back, I, I went to look back because I wanted to see them again, but they were gone. But there was a railroad track that went into a small hill. So <laughs> the missiles had retracted into a hill and it was kind of an introduction into this country is still waiting on a war. They're right there on the precipice. Um, Whereas we've been shielded from all that, being so far away from it. 
So but while you were in Korea, um, uh, I'm, did you get out to visit the country any or try the local food or any of that, those type of activities? Well, trying the local food could be dangerous. Um, they eat kimchi with kimchi or kimchi that they make themselves. Um, and there was always these rumors of dog. You know, don't eat the meat because it could be dog. Um, and the Catoosas would laugh at us about that. Um, sometimes they would, you know, but dogs was no longer really a, a food that they would eat anymore. Um, generally, I didn't spend a lot of time um, because it was just, unless you had an interpreter, it was, it was lost. We went to a mall once. It was huge. It was like three stories, this electronic mall, just um, bustling. And, and the other, when people bump into you or stand next to you or rub up against you, and, and here in the United States, we would say, excuse me. Um, in Korea, it's expected. Um, because there's just so many people in such a small area. Um, I remember getting on a, a train and uh, it wasn't rush hour, but it was still standing room only. Mm -hmm. um, and the only people that were sit seated were older women or older men. Um, but it was just very, very, for me, it was very, very chaotic. I mean, I, I grew up in uh, southern Illinois, which is fairly rural. Mm -hmm. um, running into that many people in that condensed area, um, I wasn't very comfortable with it. Um, they're, they're very loud. Um, I don't know if I should talk about this or not, but they have um, ajumas, which are madams. Um, the prostitution is legal, um, and that was that was a really big culture shock to me. Is going heading to a bar and having a woman grab me and almost drag me into a. Uh, it's like no, no, I have, I don't have any. Uh, I don't want that. Leave me alone. Um, and I thought, well, that's just that. But when we go, to, when we went to the mall, it was almost the same way. It's buy this, buy this, buy this. And in the United States, everything has a price. It's set, and that's what you're going to pay. Um, in Korea, it's not. It is a suggested price. If you want. Um, to pay less, you bargain. I wasn't a very good bargainer. Um, generally, if they set a price, I paid it. But uh, if we took a Katusa with us, usually it was a very loud, very fast conversation, which generally the price would change anywhere 10 to 15 percent. Um, it's my. It was also an introduction into different ways economics worked in other countries. I was so used to the United States. I kind of expected everybody else to be like the United States, mm -hmm. and, and they weren't. Um, so that was a little bit of growing up I had to do, I was realizing everything is not the same. Sure. So well, um, while you were in uh, Korea, you talked about um, aircraft recovery, and that was part of your duties. Did that continue on after Korea, or was that mostly while you were there? Well, um, when I left Korea, I went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky with the 101st Airborne. Um, initially, it wasn't part of my, my duty, but um, once, well, the first um, time I was involved, it wasn't even part of my division. Um, we were up, uh, the 18th Airborne Corps and the Marines cooperated in Operation Purple Dragon. It was in, uh, outside of Fort Bragg. 
Um, it was the largest airborne operation since World War II. Um, and this aircraft wasn't even flying. It was being tested. Um, they were testing an engine and testing a torque. And a girl who'd gone to AIT with me was the crew chief who was working on the aircraft. Um, this is, as my understanding um, of what happened, uh, I don't want to get too technical. Um, they had made a couple of mistakes, um, in my opinion. In the opinion, it, the crewman was inexperienced, and the pilot was inexperienced. Um, they did the things that they thought were safe. Um, they had tied down the aircraft, they had secured the blades, and they were testing an engine. Uh, when the, the pilot inadvertently um, added power to the engine beyond idle, the torque twisted the aircraft. Um, and the aircraft came apart on the ground. Um, the aircraft crewman was standing over the number one engine, the right engine, um, inspecting it for leaks. She was standing. The engine cowling is actually is uh, and also an inspection platform. So she was standing on the engine cowling, and when the uh, the gust lock or the, the rotor lock broke. The blades and the torque um, rather violently turned. She was struck by the blades and uh, she died. Um, the pilot also died um, as part of the aircraft. Um, exploded into the back of his seat. Um, part of it um, hit him in the back of the head and killed him. Um, and it was just um, a mechanical test. And it was the next time that I was involved in finding out what happened. And, um, simply because I had experience in doing it before. Um, There were five people that died in Operation Purple Dragon, a non-wartime exercise. Two, two gentlemen died um, during the airborne drop. One had a shoot failure and the other had a heart attack. Um, and another gentleman, I say gentleman because he's wrong, one woman and four men died. Um, I don't know their ranks or I would provide them. I know that they were all enlisted. Um, no, there was a first lieutenant and a private first class um, in the aircraft accident. Um, and there was a lower enlisted infantryman who was actually <clears throat> run over he was sleeping in a field. And the infantry, um, when they're moving, they try to remain invisible at all times. Um, and this gentleman was invisible to the truck and the truck ran over him. It, when you put, you know, tens of thousands of soldiers in a small area, things happen, accidents happen. but. There's an idea um, with the American public is that soldiers only die in war. Um, well, soldiers very, very often die in accidents. And I guess it's cliche to say training accident, but there are a lot of training accidents. Uh, when we train, we train like it's for real. Sometimes that's on the edge. Most of the time, it's not. We're trying to stay safe, but sometimes 
You just can't be as safe as you want to. And again, when an aircraft fails, there's nowhere to pull over. Um, whether there were traffic accidents or whatnot, um, you have a you have a mistake with a 60-ton tank. Someone's going to end up getting really, really hurt or dying, and it's it's just one of the things that I wanted to make sure I got across was just because these men weren't being shot at didn't mean they didn't put their lives on the line. The next time that I was involved um, with an aircraft recovery, I was more involved than I wanted to be. Um, when I would go to work, uh, I wore a flight suit. So one of our neighbors, um, you generally know all of your neighbors because you live so close together. I lived on post in a place called Lee Village on post. Um, and I had just um, left a 24-hour duty of uh, guarding the aircraft. Um, there has to be a guard on the aircraft at all times, as, uh, at least at the heliport. And I was at home. And there were eight battalions of aircraft at uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, the 101st and, and the 159th Aviation Regiments. Um, and one of my neighbors, um, I, I wish I remembered her name, but I don't, was rather frantically knocking at my front door. I had been asleep for about three hours. Um, my wife woke me up said, you know, this woman wanted to talk to me, and she was frantic, uh, and I went downstairs, and she said, you know, my husband's supposed to be coming back um, from the field from training today, and he was supposed to fly in, and, her, and the big rumor is there's an aircraft crash. You know, what's going on, what's going on? I, you know, I know you can find out, can you find out? And I went into the kitchen and I, I called the hangar and I talked to uh, Sergeant Napoli, who's my flight sergeant, my platoon sergeant. Um, and I told him what was going on and, and this woman, her husband was a pathfinder. Now, the, in the aviation we weren't very close with pathfinders. They're the ones that find places for us to land. Um, and Often, if we're flying in a very small unit, it would be them, three, four, five men, um, who would insert before, you know. So, and they were actually infantrymen attached to our units. So, I knew him in passing. I didn't know him very close. But I, it was part of 6th Battalion. No, I take that back. It was part of 5th Battalion, which is another Black Hawk Battalion. Um, I asked Sergeant Napoli, you know, what's going on? I've, I've got a woman here, you know, she's rather frantic about her husband. I said, there's a crash, is there a crash? What happened? And I knew something was, was wrong with the situation immediately when he told me, don't say anything to her and don't let her leave. Um, and he asked, you know, he got some information from me, you know. He knew where I lived. I mean, my platoon sergeant knew where everybody lived. But he wanted to get her name. And, you know, he passed that along. But my wife came in the kitchen after I hung up the phone. And she's like, what's going on? She's like, you got to tell her something. And I said, I can't. I said, I can't even go out there. I can't even look, to, look at her right now because I know. Um, and... My wife's like, so what do you mean? It's like, look, just go talk to her and keep her there for a while. I mean, it was the longest 15 minutes of my life. I'm in the kitchen of a, of a very small, I guess you would call it townhouse. 
with a frantic woman in my living room with my wife, and I know that her husband's dead. And I can't say anything. Um, eventually, an officer, about 15 minutes later, an officer and a chaplain um, came to my house um, and told her. But it was the most helpless I'd ever felt in the military. Um, and it was a conversation I never wanted my wife to have. I never, I never spoke to her after that. Um, I saw her, I mean, I even helped her move. I just, I just couldn't say anything to her. It was just, seven men died on, they were returning and it was winter. And uh, they were all excited about getting out of the field. Um, so they were flying they were flying aggressively. Um, and they had popped up over a, uh, a grove of pine trees. And in the middle of his pine trees was an oak tree, which, without leaves, they didn't see until it was too late. Um, when they saw it, they attempted to avoid it, but the tree struck the tail boom, um, and all seven them, four crew members and three passengers died. Um, I was involved with um, identifying um, parts of the aircraft, identifying impact points, which was crazy because the aircraft was in pieces. Um, the aircraft struck the ground at approximately 160 Gs. Um, the floor of the aircraft was on top of the cockpit. Um, Like I said, the military trained us for almost everything, but they never trained us for that. And our wives all knew each other, and Amy, um, who I'm still with, uh, <laughs> after almost 19 years, uh, she had talked to me about that, about how their conversations changed. They'd all heard about, you know, soldiers dying in accidents, but when it happens two doors down, it becomes a bit, you know, and I never wanted to be in that position to have to tell someone that. Um, I ended up doing funeral detail, but we, uh, for us, that was transportation of the bodies. We didn't actually uh, bury the bodies. That was done. They were sent home. But uh, again, I can't imagine what it's like to tell someone because the one time that I was involved in that, I couldn't even speak. I knew, I knew I would give it away. Um, I was involved with an aircraft incident. Uh, it was, I wanna say, November, November of 99, I had, uh, we were doing what's called a night insertion aircraft. Uh, we train to fly low, to fly close, 
and to fly at night, um, which is pretty dangerous. When you have aircraft flying less than 50 feet away, a lot of people think 50 feet's a large distance. When you're in the air, it's not. A heavy gust of wind and suddenly you're right next to them. Um, at that time, I'd been on flight status for a while. Um, I had experience, uh, and I was working with an IP, which is an instructor pilot, um, who was training a lieutenant that had transferred into our unit, our new platoon XO, flight XO. I'm sorry, platoon XO. Um, he was in, we call them chalks, you know, because they used to use chalk to identify where the aircraft was. And we would fly like this, one here, one here, and one here. Um, there was an aircraft in front of us, and we were here. The, when you're flying under night vision goggles, because we would wear night vision goggles, your 3D perception gets all messed up because you're basically looking at two television screens and trying to determine your how far something away. So your depth of perception is basically gone. And it takes a while to get used to. And the pilot wasn't used to it. Um, and it was like everything kind of went wrong at the same time. Uh, I turned to ensure that the aircraft behind us was far enough away. The instructor pilot turned to change the frequency of a radio, and we began drifting toward the aircraft in front of us. Um, there's a saying that helicopters don't fly, they beat the air into submission, so there's a lot of rotor wash. And what happened was, when he went to pull up, there was so much chop that he started moving forward and he couldn't slow down. Um, you sort of feel the aircraft and it's kind of like bumping. You have it, you have lift, you don't. You have lift, you don't. So it's, it's a strange feeling. Um, I knew what the feeling was. Um, my head snapped up, the instructor pilot snapped. And um, I immediately called brake left, brake left, brake left and we shot away. Um, the instructor pilot immediately pulled us away. But I remember looking out and I could see the expression of the other crew chief as he watched our aircraft coming at his aircraft. Um, and you're not supposed to be close enough to see his expression. So it was another time where you realized exactly how much danger you were in just doing your job. Well, you, um, as you were coming to an end of your time at Fort Campbell, um, did you continue in the military? Did you get, what did you do? Um, no, I, I, I had already determined that I had two children by then that I couldn't keep doing this. Um, especially um, after that incident, um, I had talked to my wife and I had determined that I love my country, I love the military, but I love my family. Um, I gave enough. And it was at that point that I decided that I was not going to re-enlist. Though I, and when I enlisted, I had fully intended to um, be a lifer, finish out my 20. But I just couldn't do it after that. Um, I guess, you know, being involved in aircraft recovery, it didn't help 
that I was constantly on that point, but I got tired of burying my buddies. Um, and the incident um, in the night insertion also brought some very sharp clarity to the fact that it wasn't just everybody else this could happen to. Um, and I had, I love my job. I loved flying. Um, I liked working on aircraft. I, li I loved having brothers. But I just keep, couldn't keep doing that um, to my wife and to my children. My boys at the time, I have three children now, but at the time I didn't want them to well, grow up without their father. So after you were um, left the army, um, that's what I came. Okay. All right. So let's see. So if you could just wrap up, I mean, just do a uh, you know just a few sentences. How would you say that military life has affected you, or has um, has it been um, uh, or helped you learn life lessons or those type of things? Well, because one of the biggest things was you you got to know that this is a great country, mm -hmm. especially going overseas um, to Korea. There was a point I didn't mention it. There was a point where we had. Uh, um, did a rapid deployment to Honduras for hurricane relief. Mm -hmm. um, we were only there for about a month, but you know, you got to see that the rest of the world doesn't live like we do. Um, and it was in the United States, if you don't like something, you're allowed to say so. In other places, you're not. Um, in the United States, you choose to serve. In other places, you don't. So that was, I guess you'll run into it with every man who served, especially every man who served overseas. This is a great country. You know, we have a lot, even if it doesn't seem like you have a lot. We have a lot here. Well, Shannon, I want to thank you so much for your time, for taking time to talk with me today, and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you.